we can characterize this sort of lay expression of the normal distribution that you see here, let's try to characterize it a bit more mathematically. All right, now I want you to imagine that you have a distribution. Eta is the mean of the distribution of the observations. Sigma squared is the variance of the distribution of observations. And I don't care a hoot and a holler about the shape of the distribution. I don't care what its name is. And really, I don't care whether this is a discrete distribution or a continuous distribution. It really doesn't make any matter at all. Eta is the mean of the distribution of the observations. Sigma squared is its variance. And, uh, and the shape is arbitrary. It turns out that if we compute averages, based on n observations each drawn from this distribution, these averages tend to have a normal distribution with the same mean. That normal will have the same mean as the mean of the parent observations, but its variance will be the variance of the parent observations, the distribution, parent distribution, divided down by n. The variance of this normal will be sigma squared divided down by n. Now, you remember when I talked about the uh, central limit theorem, there were really two weasel words. One was the word almost. I said, regardless of the form of the distribution, almost. And why did I say that? Well, I say that to keep my more mathematical friends happy. Uh, there is a um, sort of pathological distribution which was cooked up by a mathematician named Cauchy. It's called the Cauchy distribution. <clears throat> and what are the uh, attributes of the Cauchy distribution? By golly, you take observations from a Cauchy, and you take their averages, and you plot the averages, and three guesses what happens. <laughs> and they're not normally distributed. Well, that isn't going to happen to us very often. This is a sort of a mathematical toy, if you will. In practice, the sort of distributions of observations that we encounter in a laboratory or that we encounter on a production floor, those averages, by golly, are going to have a normal distribution. All right? Now, the other weasel word that we put in the uh, uh, lay uh, definition of the central limit thing was the word averages tend uh, to have a normal distribution. What do I mean by tend? Well, tend in the following fashion. If I have a smooth distribution, a symmetric distribution, then averages of two or three observations will look normal, really and truly. Of course, if I have a distribution that's bimodal or oddly shaped, then the tendency of the average is to look, the averages when plotted, to look like a normal distribution isn't quite as rapid. But you can increase the tendency of the averages to plot like a normal distribution by increasing the number of observations. So in general, we say when three or four observations are uh, gathered together into an average, those averages will have a normal distribution. If you'd like to be a bit more conservative, just say, well, when six or seven observations are gathered together in the average, those averages are normally distributed. If you want to be terribly conservative and take out insurance against all sorts of adverse uh, parent distributions of observations, you might want to run that up to as high as 20 or something of that fa fashion. But golly, that isn't just going, that just doesn't happen very often. And if we all remember that taking observations is expensive. Uh, it's good to know that averages of based on few observations tend to have this important distribution, the normal distribution. Now let's see how else I can fix this idea in your mind. Maybe we better look at it geometrically. So let's go and look at this particular thing uh, geometrically. Uh, here's a distribution of observations. Uh, this distribution of observations is uh, skewed. There's its mean, there's the first moment of the distribution. All right. Now I want you to imagine that you dip into that distribution and you experience six observations, you take their average. And then you go back and you compute another average of six. And you go in and take another average of six. And you just do this over and over and over again. And you start making a distribution of averages. What will that distribution of averages look like? And by golly, it's going to be a normal distribution, as we'll see in just a moment here. There we go. It's a normal distribution. Right? The averages will tend to have a normal distribution. And what about that normal distribution? That normal distribution will be located at the same position. The mean is the location parameter. And the normal will have a mean the same as the mean of the parent distribution of observations. The variance of this normal distribution, you remember the square root of the variance is the distance out the point of inflection on the curve? The, the variance of this uh, normal distribution is equal to the variance of the parent distribution uh, divided down by n. So there, schematically, is a, a geometric feel for what the central limit theorem is all about. OK, now maybe our best bet is to uh, try to uh, fix all this with a, a numerical example. And I'll lock it in. So let's imagine, in this case, that uh, we're taking uh, observations uh, from a distribution, and that its mean is 83, 
and that the distribution has a variance of nine. And I don't know the name of the distribution, I don't know its shape or anything, I don't even know it's discrete, perhaps. And usually you'd know that, but let's imagine we have no, th no other information save the mean and the variance. And we've taken four observations and we've, comp we've determined that the average is 85. The average of those four observations is 85. And now comes the $64 question. What's the probability that we can get an average of 85 from observations drawn from this parent distribution? Okay? That's our problem. Now let's see if we can get this problem displayed in some simple way. So, have a familiar tool here. Here's a scale, there's a normal distribution. Now the thing to remember is that the reference distribution for averages is a normal distribution. Right? So there's the normal distribution, okay? The reference distribution for averages is a normal distribution with a mean eta, so that normal distribution is gonna to have to be situated at a mean eta, which was the mean of the parent population. So the mean of the parent population was 83, as I remember. All right. And what about the variance of that normal distribution? It has to equal sigma squared over n. Now, sigma squared was 9, and n was 4. So the variance of that normal is 9 fourths, or if you will, the distance out to the point of inflection on the curve is 3 halves. And you'll all notice that we've been very careful to make the scaling here equal to 3 halves. The standard deviation is the scaling parameter. And you'll notice I'm talking about the standard deviation of the averages. That little Y bar underneath there, that subscript Y bar, tells you that I'm dealing with the standard deviation of the averages, and sure enough, it's equal to 3 halves. So there's my normal distribution, uh, which I can anticipate, uh, which represents the averages spawned by that parent population. It's located at, at, um, it's located at 83, and its standard deviation is 3 halves. Now, what happened to us? We got an average of um, 85. So let's see, 85, 83... 84 and a half, 85 ought to be about there. All right. And now our question, you remember, is what is the probability that we will get an average of 85 or something more extraordinary? And because we knew the reference distribution for the average, we were able to set this problem up. Well, we have everything we need, don't we? Because that's a familiar problem to us by now. How would I solve such a problem? Well, I'd have to calculate the normal deviant. And so we go back to the board and worry about the normal deviant. You all recall the normal deviant. Right. What's it equal to? Z is equal to Y minus eta divided down by sigma squared. Now watch the hook, all right? This is not the equation we're going to use for the normal deviant. This tells me that the y's are normally distributed, and I don't know what the distribution of the observations is. What's normally distributed in our case? The averages are normally distributed. And so the correct form in this instance for the normal deviate is the following. Z is equal to y bar. See, those are the little guys that are normally distributed. Not the observations, but the averages. All right. Y bar minus their mean, eta, divided down by the variance of these statistics, the variance of these quantities, which is sigma squared over n. All right. Now, what did we have in our example? Let's see now. Uh, the mean was 83. I just have to solve for z. Mean is 83, a y bar, oh yes, was 85. The variance of the parent population of observation was nine. There are four observations in each average. So this is nine over four. So z turns out to be equal to two divided by the square root of nine fourths. That's uh, four thirds or uh, 1.33. Right. And now I have the question. What is the probability that I'll observe a value of z equal to 1.33 or something more extraordinary? And uh, luck is with me. I have a set of tables here, and so it's the old game. Set and look it up. z is equal to 1.33. What's the probability? The probability that I'll observe a value of z greater than or equal to 1.33 is 0 0.092. The probability that you'll observe a value of z greater than or equal to 1.33 is 0 0.092. It happens about 9% of the time. Well, that's the answer to our question. As a consequence, right, we find out that the probability, returning to our original problem, the probability that we will get an average y bar greater than or equal to 85 given, see that vertical slash there stands for the word given, given 
that eta was 83 and sigma squared was 9, and that the average was based on four observations. The probability of that event, everything in the curly brackets, the probability of that event is 0 0.092. And why was I able to solve this problem in the absence of any information about the character of the distribution of the individual observations? What permitted me to do this? The fact that the reference distribution for averages is a normal distribution. The way I'd locked myself into the normal distribution was because I knew what the reference distribution of the averages was. The reference distribution for averages is a normal with a mean eta and a variance sigma squared over n. Okay, that's very important. Now I want to talk about another very important idea relative to averages. And in order for me to do this, I'm going to have to describe a mathematical model. And we see on the blackboard here a mathematical model appropriate for all observations. Right? Y is equal to eta plus epsilon. Now, eta is a mean, a fixed quantity, a fixed number, and the epsilons are little disturbances that pop in and disturb eta so that we observe Y. Right? Y is what we observe. Now, that mathematical model represents every observation I'll ever collect. Suppose I collected three observations, and that mathematical model will say Y1 is equal to eta plus a disturbance epsilon 1. So on down, y3 is equal to eta plus its disturbance. So actually the observations I get are characterized in terms of this uh, mathematical model. All right, now let's compute the average. All right, what would you do? You'd sum these up and divide by three. You have three eta divided by three. Y bar, the average, would equal eta plus, and then you'd have to sum the little errors, of course, summing both sides at equal sign, epsilon one, epsilon two, epsilon three, divided bound by three. Now what's characteristic of these epsilons? Well, some are plus and some are minus. Most are small and very few are large. And so as we sum them up, this quantity in the numerator here will never get terribly large. And on top of everything else, right, the number of observations that enters uh, this particular averaging process here uh, is not one, but it grows as n grows. And so the, this disturbance gets less and less the larger uh, n becomes. So we say that y bar is a statistic which estimates eta. And you can notice that y bar will become a better and better estimate of eta as the number of observations uh, in our average increases. The role of the errors is diminished as n increases. All right, now what do we want to say now? First of all, the average is a statistic, okay? The average is a statistic. The other thing you want to observe is that this statistic, the average estimates, the average estimates the mean, all right? And the other thing, in more mathematical detail, we would say y bar estimates eta, all right? Statistics vary. The average is a statistic. The average estimates the mean. Y bar estimates eta. All right. Well, now, it's time for a uh, short review. First of all, the reference distribution for averages is the normal distribution with a mean eta and a variance sigma squared over n. Okay? That's the one important point we wanted to make. Now, another important point we want to make in this particular lecture is the following, right? The average is a statistic. The average is something we can try from the observations. Averages vary, and incidentally, averages have a normal distribution. But the, the statistic estimates the parameter, right? Y bar estimates data. Statistics estimate parameters. The statistic becomes a better estimate of the parameter as the number of observations in the statistic increases. This particular statistic, that's true of. Y bar is a better and better estimate of the mean as eta increases. The mean is fixed, but the averages vary. Now you'll notice I've been carefully used two words. I'm reserving the word average for the statistic, and I'm reserving the word mean for the parameter, and by golly, for the rest of this course, we're going to keep the word average to indicate the statistic, the variable thing that we endure and, and calculate ourselves, and we're going to reserve the word mean for that balance point for the conceptual infinitude of observations I might have obtained. The mean is a parameter. We reserve Greek letters for parameters, and Y bar is a statistic, a variable quantity. We reserve Roman letters for such statistics. It's an important distinction. One of the difficulties in reading statistics, gang, is that when you read statistics, you, uh, the authors are sometimes not terribly clear about whether they're talking about the statistic or the parameter. And if you don't keep some sort of separation of words to help clarify things, uh, learning uh, statistics can be a little awkward. Well, now, I think uh, we've had enough for the day. And uh, frankly, gang, I uh, believe that uh, I'll just go back and uh, see if I can uh, 
win that car I'm so anxious about. <laughs> Come on now, let's see what we can get this time. Three, golly Pete. Let's see if we can get a three before we can get a seven. Come on. Come on, boy. Daddy needs a new car. A three. Let's have a three.